Float planing is the best of two worlds, flying and boating, with the added freedom of going anywhere there's water, from the backwoods of Arkansas to the backwoods of Maine. Flying over the popular lakes of Florida or the unknown lakes of Alaska. Here in our last frontier, the airplane is the fastest and often the only carrier. The early Alaskan bush pilot has already earned a place in American folklore. Today, near Anchorage, modern pilots still fly the bush, making up the largest float plane operation in the world at Lakes Hood and Spinard. But no matter where you operate, the fundamentals of flying floats are the same. Out in the suburbs of Anchorage is Campbell Lake. Resident pilots have float planes right in their own front yard. You'll find pre-flight checkout of the float plane generally similar to that of a land plane. One obvious difference is you have to be careful on your walk around. Inspection of water rudder cables and pulleys is a must. Without free movement, directional control will be seriously impaired on the water. Besides checking the general condition of the floats, inspect all compartments for excess water. Before each flight, look for possible leakage. Knowing the prevailing wind and water condition is part of the pre-flight procedure. Before leaving the dock, you should evaluate conditions for taxiing and takeoff and plan a dock departure to avoid boats, other aircraft, or obstructions. Taxi a float plane very slowly or quite fast. A slow taxi does not create a bow spray which can damage the prop. As the throttle is smoothly opened and the aircraft picks up speed, spray increases at the bow of the floats. The stick is held all the way back and the bow of the floats lifts out of the water as you move on to the step. The spray line is definitely back of the propeller. Once on the step, power can be reduced. To avoid prop damage and engine overheating, there is no proper in-between. Either taxi slowly, or when conditions are favorable and there's a long distance to cover, taxi on the step. For takeoff under no wind or glassy water conditions, you can get some assistance by circling around and roughing up the surface. A small wake helps unstick the floats. Float flying is not considered to be difficult to learn. Landings and takeoffs are comparatively simple in water areas that are generally large and traffic free. However, keep an eagle eye out for unexpected traffic. Once on the step, merely add power and accelerate for takeoff. When sufficient flying speed is attained, a very slight increase in back pressure will lift the aircraft cleanly off the water. The float plane is affected by wind and or current. Power off, this aircraft is drifting backwards from the wind. With proper control application, it can be directed toward a desired point on the shore. In a strong wind, a power turn is used in turning from upwind to downwind, 
as centrifugal force helps to overcome the upsetting effects of the crosswind. Extreme elevator position can cause porpoising, either too far back or too far forward. If you're unable to correct a porpoising condition, close the throttle immediately and start your takeoff again. A premature liftoff or lowering the nose too soon after liftoff can result in flying back into the water. When forced to operate from a small pond or in a restricted area, apply the same techniques used for short field landing. Proper speed and approach path control brings you in and stopped as quickly as possible. Sometimes it's easier to get into than out of a small lake. Within a confined area, a taxi turn helps accelerate to lift off speed. Then climb out at best angle of climb speed to provide the most clearance. Flying floats, the single most deceptive phenomenon is a flat, calm condition known as glassy water. It can be deadly. Calmness of the water tends to mislead you. The water surface looks inviting and easy. However, it's difficult to judge when to flare or round out the aircraft. Sometimes you can't see the surface, even when you're on it. We're going to line up an approach that passes close to the shore so we can maintain a reference point. Because of the power on approach, glassy water landings consume a considerable landing distance. Check out beforehand to make sure there's enough room. Set up an attitude similar to liftoff and maintain a constant descent. Remember, try to land as nearly as possible to the shoreline or next to a boat, anything that can be used as a reference. For takeoff, we'll do a step turn to cause waves. This not only helps free the floats, but also improves depth perception. Operate close to shore if possible and establish a positive rate of climb. Many pilots have made a safe glassy water landing and then during takeoff have flown back into the water. River landings have a different set of techniques and require good headwork. Winding channel, sandbars, floating logs make a river unsuitable. This river is a better choice. It's wide, deep, and seems to be free of obstacles. But before landing on any river, it's a good idea to seek advice from local pilots.
current is fast, but there are areas of calm backwater. Since the current is fast on this river, it's advisable to step taxi to ensure directional control until out of the current. Unlike a glassy water landing where we operate close to the shore, you notice we stay well clear of the bank. Wherever there are water sports, there are potential hazards. The last thing a fisherman has on his mind is to look out for airplanes, and he's liable to suddenly appear from any direction. When landing on rough water, touch down near stall speed to reduce pounding action on the floats and strain on float fittings. In working up to a low dock or float, approach slowly from alongside instead of directly toward it and take into account effects of wind and current. Make sure the engine is stopped before coming alongside. Where no helper is available on shore, get out on the float and do the fending off job from there, by yourself. Be careful though. Believe it or not, too often someone in a hurry to get on the dock jumps from a float into a still turning propeller. A ramp approach is usually easier. About 20 feet out, RPM is increased, causing the bows of the float to be raised slightly. Thus, there is little shock to the aircraft due to the float angle and the cushioning effect of the bow waves. Whether in Alaska or Florida, the techniques of float flying are similar. Float plane operators everywhere recommend avoiding boat wakes during a landing. Until the aircraft has slowed down, hitting a boat wake can damage the floats. The wake is helpful for depth perception, but touch down beyond it. Sometimes you'll find your seaplane in areas that offer no docking, mooring, or handling facilities. Before beaching on an unknown shore, inspect the bottom for sharp objects that could puncture the floats. Then, approach the beach at the slowest possible speed, cut the engine, lift the water rudders and allow the aircraft to drift gently into the beach. Once ashore, lift the tail of the airplane and carefully pull it up onto the beach. Then make sure the aircraft is secured against wind and wave action. In Maine, like Alaska, you need the float plane to reach the remote backwoods. log rafts are moved on lakes, we can usually find stray floating logs. And whether floating or submerged, logs can cause severe damage to a float.
Since so many highly experienced pilots have been fooled by glassy water, let's have a closer look. As you pass the shoreline, set up the aircraft with an attitude similar to liftoff, adjusting power as necessary to maintain airspeed about 10 miles above stall and a rate of descent of about 150 feet per minute. With a constant power setting and a constant attitude, the airspeed should remain fairly stable. Now, closely control the throttle so that a constant descent is maintained until the aircraft makes contact with the water. Glassy water accidents are caused by misjudging height above the water, either flying into or stalling out above it. Your problems are magnified if bad judgment or circumstances result in landing away from shore. Then proper glassy water technique is especially important. Once you set up for a glassy water landing, attitude and power control are the keys to success. Even though float planes can land almost anywhere, weather is still a factor not to be overlooked. BFR conditions can quickly change to IFR due to clouds or fog formation. The unwary float plane pilot may discover his water area dangerously socked in. Always have an alternate route in mind. Some pilots say once you've tasted the unique fun of float flying, you'll never want to go back to land flying again. Just once and you're incurably hooked, enjoying a nautical, salty world, combining the pleasures of boating and flying.